By being invited to this panel entitled On the Margins, it has been assumed we experience a margin of some sort. I'll leave it to each member to describe that margin, if in fact the panel members ever describe themselves in that way. I know Janet Marie Rogers in an email uh, did not like the term at all because she feels that that term marginalized means lesser than. So I'm sorry she's not here to uh, talk to us about that. I know at least um, one of them, and this could probably be said of most writers, observers, and explorers, is interested always in what is not spoken, what is not seen about otherness and absence, particularly within what might be deemed dominant discourses or cultures. Thank you, Renee. Amber Dawn writes in her poem, Queer Grace. Mm. She read it, whatever night that was. Well, a couple of times, actually, because at the Marmot Bout, and uh, here, too. So in Queer Grace, only queer kin can show you the way out in the merciless, bright, mainstream. As I think of the margin I may be part of as a lesbian, I think of the unbeaten path away from that bright mainstream. Mm. There's a liberation, a transformation of circumstances for members of my particular queer tribe express pain, abuse, small victories, strengths, and celebrate in song, visual art, dance, poetry, and other forms of activism. I've been reading Bell Hooks again recently, googling some quotes actually, based on something Renee also said in an email. Here's what Bell Hooks said in the preface to the first edition of Feminist Theory from Margin to Center. She was talking about black Americans in her hometown and the meaning of her title from margin to center. Living as we did on the edge, we developed a particular way of seeing reality. We looked from both the outside in and the inside out. We focused our attention on the center as well as the margin. We understood both. This mode of seeing reminded us of the existence of a whole universe, a main body made up of both margin and center. So now I'd like to introduce our panel members. We're going to start with uh, Nadine and Manette Maestas from Seattle, because she's actually the one that uh, came up with our subject. Mm. That's what Paul Nelson told me. <laughs> <laughs> so Nadine earned her PhD from the University of Washington, where she wrote a dissertation on postmodern anthropoetics. She also holds an MFA from the University of Michigan, where she was awarded the Hopwood Farrar Award for playwriting. Her hybrid poem play, Helen on Wheels, a play of rhyme and reason, was performed at California College of the Arts. She is a co-author with Karen Weiser of Beneath the Bright Discus, mm -hmm. and has published in Page Boy magazine, The Germ and Poor Mojo's Almanac. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Nadine. Mm -hmm. Try to keep to time here. Uh, so if you saw me talk yesterday, you know I'm not about to use this podium. <laughs> short. Six inches. Six short, actually. Um, so uh, I was actually reminded really recently that I came up with these talking points, um, and I was like, well, it does actually sound like me. Um, and as I was like, going over this, you know, on the margins. Who or what is marginal? Who or what is considered visible and worthy of being historical? I was like, I like this question because it's a cultural studies question. Right? And I was like, that's a good question. And now I'm like feeling like I'm full of myself about it. And I realize I came up with that question. <laughs> um, so <laughs> um, if you heard me talk yesterday as well, you heard me talk a little bit about my identity and my educational background. Um, I think I referred to myself as over degree. Um, there's a reason. I chose to become over degree and to take that last step um, to get a PhD, which I will talk about in a minute. But first, I want to talk about this idea of marginality. Right? Um, you know, to be at the margin means you are at the edge of things, um, likely pushing boundaries. When you think of something, a concept like deconstruction, being marginal is deconstructive, because to be constructive means that you are away from something. Right? You're outside of it and able to see that very thing itself. 
It doesn't mean to unconstruct something, right? Day means to be away from. So to be marginal in a way gives you a very deconstructive perspective of mainstream cultures, which is huge, it's important. Um, how else could a mainstream culture be identified without the margins, without finding the very margins, without finding the edge of things? And what's really cool about being in this region is we are actually at the margins geographically as well, and on like so many fault lines as was mentioned previously. Um, and earthquakes can be really destructive, and they can be really fun, but they do reorganize things, right? They absolutely reorganize things, and that's also really important. Many of us here are already living at the margins by our identities, by our economies, um, by several things. Uh, so most of us here already know what it is to be at the margin, and if you're not feeling that with your identity, you're probably feeling it with the geography in which you live in, right? Um, so it's something that a lot of us at some point can feel. You know, even stepping outside of your comfort zone and putting yourself in a new context, you can see that. So if you are part of the mainstream and you do that, there's a way in which you can also feel that sense of being marginal, right? Um, so uh, this question here is really about power, right? Who or what is being, who or what is worthy of being considered historical is a question about power. Who gets chosen? Who gets chosen to be thrown into the light, right? Uh, who gets pushed forward? Uh, so, one of the reasons that I chose this last step to get a PhD is because I wanted to become that person. I wanted that power, and I want that choice to say, this one, this poet is the one that I'm gonna excavate from the margins and throw out there and pursue and push, right? That's why I chose to get a PhD. And when I went to ask one of my <laughs> uh, mentors for a recommendation, she said to me, why would you want to do that? Why, why are you going to do that? And I just can't see that about you. And I was like, hey man, F you, I'm going to do this. You know, so like, give me a recommendation or like, don't, but I'm going to do this. She's like, no, I'm going to write you a good recommendation. Get you in there. And, and she did, you know, she really, she, she helped me get into graduate school. Um, and I ended up at the University of Washington, which is a little odd, but I chose it um, <laughs> over, my two choices were University of Pennsylvania and the University of Washington. And the very thing I hear from everyone is like, why the hell would you not go to UPenn? Mm -hmm. They have so much money, and they're number one, you'll get a job automatically. And I'm like, that's just, that's just not my thing. I wanna be where my people are at. I wanna be in a place that I can live I want to be in a place where I can be accepted. And I didn't feel like being the identity makeup that I have, that I would feel, I wouldn't feel that in Philadelphia. But what I wanted was just to feel okay in the world. And I knew that Seattle would be a better place for me to be queer than Philadelphia. And I knew that it would be a better place for me to be multiracial than Philadelphia. And I knew it would be a better place for me to be a woman than Philadelphia. And I knew that it would be a much more fun and exciting place to be a poet. Because in Seattle, and really in the Cascadia region, we get to build communities here. In Philadelphia, you get to join a community, right? They already have a community, you can join, they can accept you or they cannot accept you. But where I live, we, we make it. We invite people and we build a community, uh, much like this conference. And I see that, you know, as I'm a part of this uh, festival, uh, I get to see that all over the place, you know, and hear stories about people building community. And community is just so important to poetry. That's where you meet the writers that you're like, I'm going to pick this writer and write about this person. I'm going to pull this one out of the margins, right? Um, so <clears throat> when I'm thinking about this idea, of, of uh, being marginal, uh, it, it cuts across so many, so many points of life, so many points of my very own life. And one of the things that uh, I realize when you're at the margins of something, there is very little you have to lose, right? Yeah. You can't, what do you have to lose? You can do almost anything you want, right? And that's the most exciting part of being at the margin. You have nothing to lose and everything to build and everything to gain. 
once you build it and gain it, then you might have something to lose. But you get to participate in something, in what Habermas calls world-making. And Duncan would have referred to his poems as world-making poems, right? Um, this is what we get to do at the margins, and this is what we get to do in Cascadia, right? Um, so I'm going to end my talk here for now, because I think I'm probably pretty close to time, and uh, turn it over. But thank you. the edge of things. Yes, we do uh, make choices of uh, where it's safe to be. And uh, I was thinking about that yesterday because I was part of the workshop and uh, the first writing we were doing was from childhood and we were asked when childhood ended. And I was thinking that it's when we have to start uh, following some guidelines we establish for ourselves to keep us safe among the adults. <laughs> So, I'm going to introduce Renee next. I was so pleased to meet Renee and her husband in January when she was here for WordStorm. So, uh, Renee Sarajani Saklakar writes the Canada Project, a lifelong poem chronicle that includes poetry, fiction, and essays. Work from the Canada Project appears in literary journals, newspapers, and anthologies, including TIE or T, TCR, the Web Folio, Literary Review of Canada, the Vancouver Review, Geist, Poetry as Dance, Subterrain, Dark Poetry Magazine, the Georgia Strait, and Raika, the Journal of Provocations. The first completed series from the Canon Project is a book length poem, Children of Air India, from Nightwood Editions, mm -hmm. about the bombing of Air India, Flight 182, shortlisted for the Dorothy Livesey Poetry Prize, 2014, and winner of the 2014 Canadian Authors Award for Poetry. Renee is currently working on volume two of the Canada Project, The Heart of This Journey Bears All Patterns, commonly known as Thought Chebap, about culture, language, longing. Welcome, Renee. It's an honor to be uh, part of this festival with this panel. Thank you, Amy and Susan. And thanks to the previous panel and to all of you. Um, all of the discussions have been rich. I'm going to be thinking about them a long time, as I said to Harold Rennish. I don't know if, she's, if he's here, um, from yesterday's morning panel. And thank you, Marianne, for a lovely introduction. Um, to respond, to the Cascadia Anthology and this wonderful essay that Paul um, begins the anthology with. And the very last line is, to live here as if we again venerated this place and all its marvelous interconnected systems. And to place that last line, which introduces you to the anthology in print, as an invocation to our panel about margins. So the title of my talk for you today is The Margins Are at the Center. And thinking about living here in Cascadia, thinking about what is the here, who are we, what is this place, and how does history, if at all, interconnect with whatever we term nature or ecology? And I've prepared a little presentation for both volume two that uh, Marianne kindly introduced uh, of my project, and then I'm going to do a case study from volume one, of which if you were here Friday night, I read a little fragment, and I'll just read a few more fragments. And I'll end there, and then we can, we can have discussion, and we'll hear from Susan. Prologue. Is terror part of terroir? Oh. Prologue. The means of production for Stephen Collis. To the city, then. Approach, said the inspector. 
a calamity born in minute traces. Toward what disaster, amid plenty, no lack of fullness, this capacity surreptitious, a watching. Conventions dictated that she must. What is in a gaze to be looked at? Edifice means transport, greenery. Seated, there were no tables or chairs. Seated, they missed the old oak pews. An arborist of the time before, a place, sing, discern, separate the peoples. All tender, the leaf, a stem, saved. After, that is before, there was a rival, disputed, terror. Also color, skinned, history, aware, those men. Turbans not mentioned. River demarcating what exactly? Perimeter, a statement of polis, always <coughs> the start of something walked. Park, not graveyard. The names saved for later. Jolly, Jolly. Case study, June 23rd, 1985, on the land Cowichan, Vancouver Island. Paldi, Duncan. In high school in British Columbia in the 1980s, no one teaches the name of this village. Paldi. Name the latitude. Name longitude. <laughs> exist, does not exist. List the distances. Paldi to Duncan. Gazetteer on your map. I miss our map. <laughs> North side, Cowichan River, west of Duncan, Sotlam Land District. How close they nestle, these two, a village, a town, together. Empire is one continuous journey. Is terror part of our terroir? June 23rd, 1985, exhibit, In the Woods, Outside Duncan. British Columbia. That a bomb is made, that is known. That the bomb is set off, that is known in the woods outside Duncan, cousin town to the village, Pauly. Of all the locations in empire, real and imagined, past and present, it is here, June 23rd, 1985. There are no straight lines. If there is a man, he is making detonation. Time loads up incident. In recounting, there is implication. Describe your place. Piney scented the woods. Where is the past? We never speak of it. Exhibit 1906. Subaltern Sutra. Speak. About the tatters of history thrown roadside. There's a margin, there's a signal. 1906. Comes a man, name redacted. He is India to Canada. He is the lore that is the founding. Let the name stand. Paldi, the first town to be registered in the British Columbia Register of Geographical Names for 1906. Unauthorized interjection at the Legislative Library of Victoria, British Columbia, librarian. You know, there's not much here about Paldi. Rag, bit, story, village, empires, jewel, India, colonies, outposts, sing, Cowichan. Sing, Cowichan. Sing of your valley. What happened in the woods? Ask, ask, what happened in the woods? We never speak of it. Raga for Dominion Day, a Dormella in Paldi, British Columbia. Translation required. Punjabi into Hindi, into Cowichan, into Japanese and Cantonese, about the founding of the village of Paldi and about the man Shri, name redacted, mm -hmm. British subject, who intersects time, 1906. 
Into a century, a man and his brothers authorized entry action. There are the trees sold into logs, settler's song. There is the business of timbered lumber sold by the board, action. There are the three men, Japanese and invited. There is a sawmill. Saw you who my soul loves? Lumberstacker, the man name redacted, home village Paldi in the Punjab, builds his pioneer tree to log story, Rosedale near Chilliwack, from Strawberry Hill near New Westminster. Start afresh, relocate, Royal City to Island. Sing it, Cowichan, a song of first peoples, other peoples, pioneer and settler, sweater and lumber, vegetable and sheep, Painters and potters sing, come to Paldi, come to Paldi, we will work together. In the valley that is Cowichan, Indo, Japanese, live, work, oh pioneer Raga, sing. Exhibit, June 4th, 1985, in the woods outside Duncan, some items for your examination, Exhibit A. Sanyo AM FM stereo tuner, model number FMT 611K. Interjection, when I was a child. Item B, time. Interjection, Douglas fir, cedar, clump of alders, splinter sunlight, and shake the forest floor exhibit. In the woods outside Duncan, later that day, a woman listens. She sits in a vehicle. She works for CSIS, also the RCMP. Where is her name? It is redacted. Listen. Hmm. Allegation, this man lied 19 times. The voice of God speaks to me. My lips open, close on the word of scripture. As a child, I spoke like a child and ran freely. There were no signs of the coming years. June 23rd, 1985, starts, stops. Jailed, I live in the light that God and my guru gave me. I will ask those who write about me to assemble a litany of years. At 16, I worked the green chain in a mill. I worked machines. I am skilled in the making of things. Earned my ticket, electrician. Sound comes at me. Speak. Speak. Do not. My community is a source of comfort to me. I am not interested in community. I have no need for words of any alien tongue. My outer body is nothing to me. I crave a home-cooked meal. The woods smelled of cedar, and the air was clean. Unauthorized interjection. Intruder. If there is childhood, I am on a farm milking cows, hands on an udder, and then, and then, and then, and then, in our kitchen, mother makes roti. It is not June. It is not 1985. No sulfur, no potassium, no cadmium. Ma, ma, grum, grum, areba. Time splits. I am a young man on Vancouver Island, upriver, by the potholes. Back roads, dust in my face. Rusted flatbed rattling over riprap. It is only a small fire I make to cook trout. Case study on the land, Cowichan. To live here as if we, again, this place, interconnected. Thank you. Mm. celebrating under a full moon today, yeah. which is ideal for being together in community, putting our work out into the world, but then it's time to go back to our little caves.
And uh, right, and we can follow Renee's prompt. Describe your face. I'm going to introduce Susan Musgrave now, and uh, the mic doesn't seem to be moving any. You know, it's not. Right. It's a wreck. It's a wreck. <laughs> but we don't know what's going to happen when Susan comes up. <laughs> Okay, so Susan Musgrave's career as a social mystic began when she was kicked out of kindergarten class for laughing and sent to the library to contemplate her heinous crime while seated on the thinking chair. She understood then that books and thinking must be considered dangerous, and they became her favorite forms of escape. Not long afterwards, she dropped out of kindergarten for good. <laughs> <laughs> Susan has received awards in six different categories of writing poetry, fiction, nonfiction, personal essay, children's writing, and for her work as an editor. She has published close to 30 books. Her most recent novel is Given, latest poetry collection, Origami Dub. Susan won the Spirit Bear Award in 2013. The tribute recognizes the significance of a vital and enduring contribution to the poetry of the Pacific Northwest. Her artistic presence over the past 40 years has helped create who we are. She is as important to us as Emily Carr. Mm. That was a quote from that award, I gather. <laughs> Susan's new book, A Taste of Haida Kauai, is coming out in June from White Cat Books. Please welcome Susan. <laughs> Feel. I'm actually a polite person, but I tend to keep the thanks down at these events because they can go on. Somebody started thanking the artists for the wall, the work on the wall behind us, in case I got quite anxious. Um, I, in fact, read this as I tend to misread who or what is considered visible and worthy of being hysterical. That's why I was on the panel. But to be compared to Emily Carr, it's quite a, um, I mean, I guess, who, who knows who's considered worthy of anything. As I, when I was growing up, my father didn't really believe in my poetry because he thought, he, he, his question would be, will it last? And I was more considered, worried about whether I would last, to get through my teenage years. Um, but, you know, Keats, Shelley, the sort of, the greats were who he would compare me to, and I don't know, I never worry about lasting or, or, or being visible or being marginalized because as a writer, or all as writers, we are. I don't know any other way to be. Um, I think that goes with the, with the territory. And when um, um, Janet Rogers said that she doesn't like the word marginalized because it implies that we're all lesser, um, I think that it reminded me of, of a quotation from Malcolm Lowry, a fear reigned by doubt is my eternal moon. I think that should be all writers' um, personal motto. Uh, most writers are filled with fear and this, by doubt. No matter who you are, you always, well, there's always someone who's winning more prizes, and of course, you know, just getting more. I mean, it, it, even Margaret Atwood, I asked her for a poem once, and she sort of apologized when she sent it to me, saying, I would send something better if you know. I think, well, here we go again. <laughs> We're never good enough. <laughs> My sense of the word marginal, I, t I, take, I tend to personalize everything, that's kind of how I get through life. Um, uh, first of all, my husband was at Matt Squee Penitentiary with the Air India Bombers, and he says they tended to keep to themselves. That was just <laughs> this very discreet comment. But I would see them walking in the yard, and I know nothing about the Indian. I mean, this is how, I grew up in Victoria, I don't think there was a person of color. Oh yes, there was. There was one Chinese man, he delivered the vegetables, and he took the opium poppies from my mom's garden. And that was what, what, what I knew of anybody who wasn't white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. So when I got out into the world, it was, it was quite an education to find out that there was more than just what you found in Victoria. I think Victoria has changed a bit, but not that much. <laughs> well, there's Sesame Street now, so kids are introduced at a young age to people who are not just white. But anyway, um, so the, the turban thing interested me. The colors of the turban. I gather that orange meant you were really dangerous. Is that true? We could fill me in afterwards, but I, I was intrigued by 
you know, who these people, I, they're totally foreign to, to my life. And the other thing is you mentioned in the woods outside Duncan, now I'm absolutely nervous because that's where my daughter has just got, gotten over her addiction. So see, I'm taking from what people are saying and personalizing it. So I thought in the woods near Duncan would be a safe place for her, but now I see I have more to worry about. <laughs> so it's, uh, and, and um, what Renee said about um, the margins are at the center, well, I think about my old typewriter, which, which, you know, I had one that my my father got in Cairo during the war, and it had hieroglyphics in it. And I used to my early poems were very um, kind of avant-garde -garde because I used these these symbols in the poems, and my teachers used to comment on this. But I remember the margins. That was a thing you had to. I was playing with it the other day. It's so different from a computer. You don't have to worry about margins. The word margins to me doesn't mean means things like what's on a typewriter, and uh, you know, I'm growing up in Victoria, it's probably, I have that to blame. But um, the margins being the center with, ties in very well with the poem I wanted to read. I think that wherever we are is the center of the universe. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're on Haida Gwaii or in San Francisco or Vancouver, where you are is where everything exists, and it's sort of a wonderful thing and also a very depressing thing, because it's like my writer friends, I'll say to them, oh, I've had the flu this week. Oh, you've had the flu. I've been really sick. Like, people t take back what you say and make it their own, always. So, there really are no boundaries or margins. I don't know. Anyway, this is a poem I want to read. It's one of my favorites. It's called The Center of the Universe by Paul Durkin, who's an Irish poet whom I admire. But it's kind of about where, that, where you are. Pushing my trolley about in the supermarket, I am the center of the universe. Up and down the aisles of beans and juices, I am the center of the universe. It does not matter that I live alone. It does not matter that I am a jilted lover. It does not matter that I'm a misfit in my job. I am the center of the universe. But I'm always here if you want me, for I am the center of the universe. I enjoy being the center of the universe. It is not easy being the center of the universe, but I enjoy it. I take pleasure in, I delight in being the center of the universe. At 6 o'clock a.m., oops, I'm reading this off my computer because, 6 o'clock a.m. this morning I had a phone call. It was from a friend, a man in Los Angeles. Paul, I don't know what time it is in Dublin, but I simply had to call you. I cannot stand L.A., so I thought I'd call you. I calmed him down as best I could. But I'm always here if you want me, for I am the center of the universe. I had barely put the phone down when it rang again, this time from a friend in Sao Paulo in Brazil. Paul, do you know what is the population of Sao Paulo? I will tell you, it is 12 million skulls, 12 million pairs of feet in one foot bath, 12 million pairs of eyes in one fishbowl. It is unspeakable, I tell you, unspeakable. I calmed him down. But I'm always here if you want me. For I am the center of the universe. But then when the phone rang a third time and it was not yet 6.30 a.m., the petals of my own hysteria began to wake up and unfurl. This time it was a woman I know in New York City. Paul, New York City is a cage. And she began to cry a little over the phone, to sob over the phone, and from 5,000 miles away I mopped up her tears. I dabbed each tear from her cheek with just a word or two or three from my calm voice. I'm always here if you want me, for I am the center of the universe. But now, tonight, it is myself, sitting at my aluminum double-glazed window in Dublin City, crying just a little bit into my black t-shirt. If only there was just one human being out there with whom I could make a home, share a home. Just one creature out there in the night. Is there not just one creature out there in the night? In Helsinki, perhaps, or in Reykjavik, or in Chap Chapelazoid, or in Malahide. So you see, I have to calm myself down now, if I am to remain the center of the universe. It's by no means an exclusively self-centered, automatic thing, being the center of the universe. I'm always here, if you want me, for I am the center of the universe. <laughs> So, I tend not to ever consider what I'm supposed to talk about till the morning of. And then after listening to some two amazing speakers, of course now I'm feeling that the fear of ring by doubt is my eternal moon. And I'd like to just <laughs> turn, the, <laughs> turn this over to the, to the audience. Um, uh, I, yeah, I will. Um, because 
I, I'd rather, I think we need to have a conversation yeah, now, yeah. so you can tell me what orange turbans mean for one thing. Uh, but yeah, well, I think that we're, as writers, as I say, we're, we're, we live marginalized, um, whatever gender, whatever our, you know, whatever our preferences are in all areas, and then you get so used to that, that you're at the center of the universe, you don't, um, you're aware of everything else, but it comes back to you and at you all the time, and that's it. That's my preparation. Everybody else has no I don't have a PhD. I have grade 10 failed. <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so Nadine said she was over degreed, so I can relate to that. But it's temperature. It's <laughs> 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 getting a bit better. Yeah. <laughs> Some sort of breeze happening now. Okay, so um, I wondered if um, Renee or uh, Nadine had any comments to make because of what else you've heard. <laughs> Uh, you want to, before we open it up, yeah. you want to come back up? Sure. And, uh, okay. So Renee's going to come back and let us know what thoughts she has now. <laughs> okay. Orange turbans. <laughs> Thank you. Isn't it wonderful when people just say it? Yeah. Mm. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, are we supposed to have a mic here? Um, oh, oh and, no, no, yeah. no, no. It's their talk of the When we go to yeah. the discussion. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. And I can sit there and do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My husband would call it having no filter. Awesome. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's liberating. I'm extremely filtered, which I think is part of, as Joanne Arnott, who's so thoughtful, she's yeah, not here, you. says, when you are othered, um, you learn to become very careful. Yeah and very filtered, so it's incredibly liberating. Let's go back to orange turbans. Oh, yeah. um, so of course, Rita isn't here, but I feel like, oh, yeah, Rita, so you're kind of my muse about, you know, things that are complicated and difficult, but we still engage with them gently. And, and to say orange turbans, what I am conscious of as a non-Punjabi, English speaking, English is my mother tongue, even though locked in this brown skin, um, one, one worries about objectification. So if there was a man here who was Punjabi and happened to <laughs> worship Sikh faith and happened to have an orange turban, this is what I can tell you. I would be nervous. Oh. Because traditionally in British Columbia, the wearing of an orange turban was like the wearing of the green in Ireland, because my husband's Irish, and I'm actually Irish in another life. <laughs> um, um, it is a deeply political symbol. And so, yes, the wearing of an orange turban in the 80s, particularly in British Columbia, was a sign that you were an adherent of Khalistan, a nationalist movement, more prevalent, ironically, here. I mean, here, uh, than anywhere in, in India. So, Yes. Yeah. Now, about this business of in the woods outside of London. <laughs> <laughs> again, um, I think I was the first writer, certainly the first poet, to have one of those light bulb moments sitting in the archive that is, you know, Canada's, I mean, this is a terrible problematic phrase, but I'll just say it. Uh, Canada's 9-11. Um, in the archive that is that, 17,000 documents from one of the most expensive criminal trials, one of the longest judicial inquiries, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. I haven't read all those documents, but I read a good number from my own personal family archive. My aunt and uncle uh, perished on that flight. And um, there is this sense of um, something happening not just over there in Ireland, but on Vancouver Island, right? in Cascadia, in deep in Cascadia. And so this idea of place in the woods outside Duncan 
is my offering to Cascadia and the deep thinkers about my opening question, can terror form a terroir that we examine when we think of layering onto the maps we make of this place and hopefully become more responsible. So when I held up the poetry book, when I said Sing Cowichan, what I have struck out in, in the book are the names of all the First Nation languages and sub-languages that of course I don't know, that I'm not student enough, that in a way I have no right to. And I, I felt like I could not just write those names. I have to interrupt them because I have to show I was taking a little bit of responsibility for my settler identity. Uh, in the woods outside Duncan, so I was the first poet to go, you know what? In the woods outside Duncan, Khalistani nationalists setting off bombs, that must be linked to Paldi some way. So like Rita going up to the headwaters, I did a personal pilgrimage, if you will. Hillcrest Road, Highway 18, mm -hmm. the turnoff outside Duncan. I went to the place, right? How do we come, become more responsible for the place? Um, sorry. No, that was an accident, sorry. No. No. But I think <laughs> just, yeah, yeah, I think I'll stop there. But I just wanted to fully engage and, and, and honor that. And, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Renee. And um, Nadine, did you want to make any yeah. comments before we go to our question and answer? I'm just going to sit here if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't like the games very much. Um, you know, in Germany, poems are like extra tall. The Germans are really tall. Uh, <laughs> uh, I guess just one of the things I want to respond to is actually, it makes me really sad. Uh, to hear people thinking of the term marginal or marginalized as lesser than. Yeah. Um, because that's a perspective that I consider as part of my work to change and part of the, the questions here. Because margin doesn't mean lesser than. In no, in no dictionary will you find that. It means at the edge of things, right? Um, and that seems really important to consider for us you know, here today. Um, while I understand the perspectives um, in terms of poetry and literature and, and art um, and personal identities of how people talk about marginality and that there is an implication of there being a lesser than quality to it. Um, I do want to bring this back to the actual definition that it is just means being at the edge of things, right? Um, and that, you know, from, there are many, many political theorists, in fact, this is a, an important role to consider um, and, you know, when Derrida wrote his essay on Paul Ceylon's work, he wrote about the date. That's it. And he, his perspective is from the date. Um, so he's just writing about it because it's outside of the poem. Right? It's not part of the poem, but it is part of the poem. It has a relationship to the poem. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's just, it, you know, Foucault would have had the same perspective um, to look at things that are at the edge of things, look at societies and, and whatnot to look back at laws that were just kind of fucked up. Um, so, uh, and I think that this is something that we consider uh, maybe all of our work to endow the word margin or re-endow it um, and the identity is marginalized with, with power rather than considering it to be lesser than. That seems really important to remind ourselves that it's a powerful place to be. It's a powerful, powerful, powerful perspective um, to have, and it makes people very, very scared, yeah. right? They are afraid of it because of what it can do. Um, so I hope that, you know, in addition to this, this question of the actual term that Janet's brought to us, and, you know, if you know me and you, you, you saw me at the last Cascadia Poetry Festival, you know I love to be challenged on <laughs> anything. Um, I love to have conversations. I invite it uh, whenever I can. Um, so I really appreciate that because it's making me think about this and it's really reminding me um, you know, what, what I consider my work and really all of our work here um, to be, right? Can I say something? Yes. Um, I'm not saying that it's actually a bad thing to be less, lesser than. I, you know what I mean? It's not... Yeah, totally. It's not... Yeah, okay. I, I, I'm not, I didn't say that anyway, that was Jan. Yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> that's why I quoted the Lowry thing, because I think yeah. that right
I, we do feel, I grew up feeling lesser than, less worthy, and I don't know why, I have no reason to, other than it's something I've constructed, so. Um, but the, the thing is language, it's a word, uh, I was on a committee to rewrite the um, Oath of Canadian Citizenship, and there were six Francophone writers and six Anglophone writers, and oh my god, so the committee writing something like that anyway, the word diversity came up. And the Francophone writer said, you cannot use that word. It means it's a very negative thing in our, in our language. Wow. In our language, it's like it, respecting people in all their diversity. Oh, no, that was not good. So this took days, and then they didn't use it anyway. I did a reading where the poster were six women. It was in um, London, Ontario, and the poster said, broadly speaking. And I got really upset. I said, oh, my God, there's a terrible mistake in this poster. Somebody, some man has made this poster about us. It turns out, again, the, the word has been taken back. This is years ago, and reclaimed, but I didn't know that. So I come to words kind of innocently with, uh, uh, those two degrees that you have, or you don't need them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, I know. No, they, they mean nothing, I know. Only just years of your life. <laughs> that is exactly true, right? Yeah, and like, I mean, the reason I did go, go to get all those degrees was so that I could be in a position uh, to to have people look at me and be like, ooh, you have yeah. degrees, that you have something yeah. important to say. It's like, yeah, I do, about these writers that I want to talk about. Yeah. You know, like, that was really important to me, and it still is. Yeah. It's like, the re that is an enormous reason. It's just like, yeah, I gotta, yeah, no one's paying attention to these writers that I want people to pay attention to, and they're really important. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, and they really, I mean, intelligence is not measured by degrees by any means. Um, I can't tell you that about myself because I am intelligent, but my colleagues, some of my colleagues, they're really they're very good students, right? They're very good students and very smart people, but getting degrees does not indicate intelligence necessarily, right? Uh, so, anyways, please, please stop degree shaming me, Susan. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> So if if we're on the edge and we fall <coughs> off, where do we land? Mm. On another edge. Wow. Oh. I mean, even just looking at David McCloskey's maps would, would, would tell us that, right? Just, just hope you can hold your breath underwater and resist the pressure. But I mean, I think that's really what happens if you fall off an edge. You do, like in, in a metaphor sense, you land, you land right on another edge, right? And we're gone. Yeah, I'd love to piggyback off that. I, I think that, um, like you, Nadine, I feel like um, a, a marginalized identity is um, a, a fertile ground, right? Um, the whole idea of like dance like no one is watching you know when no one is watching us when no one is looking to us to create this dominant narrative we get to say dance celebrate fuck love how whatever however we want to um which is a very beautiful um and fertile reason for existing on the map uh, on the on the margins um but to piggyback off this I, th I think that most folks who would in some way uh, identify with a, a marginal identity have also seen a lot of loss and grief, have yes. seen a lot of pain, have seen yeah. others perhaps that are on the margins not fair as well as us in terms of turning out books of poetry, uh, being a graduate student, and whatever have you. Um, so how do you reconcile the loss of our people on the margins, um, and what do we do as artists to address all of that loss? Mm -hmm. That sounds like a PhD question to me. I was, um, oh, I was very encouraged in this conference by the word witnessing that mm. came up, and mm. certainly in writing about this um, incident. Um, you know, how to get, as Roll said the night we gave the tribute to Peter Cully on Friday, you know, how to get beyond the self and into something that it has a social historical significance, but not to deny itself, mm -hmm. and, and how to negotiate that. And so for me, it, the word witness has some resonance for falling off the edge and wherever you find yourself, and then addressing grief. Mm. Be kind. You know, yeah. Somebody said on Facebook, I don't know who they quoted, but be kind because everybody you know is fighting a great battle. Mm -hmm. you know, there are people that I get just don't like or don't want to be around, and then I find out what's happening in their life, and I think, 
you know, so, so much worse than mine. Mm -hmm. And most people's, it is. It, they, their lives are worse than ours. Mm -hmm. Well, I say that. They're not worse, but their problems are huge. There's, you know, so many things. So just, I guess, just that's all you can do. You can't take on the world. At least I can't. <laughs> Uh, I just want to say one thing to this question as well. Is I, I don't reconcile it, actually. Um, I don't find reconciliation there. In fact, just again, I'm just going to say this, this is part of the work I want to do, is to like bring these communities back. And like Susan, I can't take on the whole world. That's why I keep saying we all have to do it, right? Like We all need to take a part in, the, in that. But um, I, it's, there's almost no way I can find to reconcile something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah true. Thank you. Uh, Lisa. Uh, one of the curses of marginalization is popular culture. So how do you respond to the bastardization of marginalization? Like the downtown east side, you know, you can go buy t-shirts now. DTES and oh hats and DTS and... Heroin chic, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or, you know, I'm the mom of a child with disabilities. Now we have TV shows, you know, I can't remember what that show is, about the guy with autism and all this. Like, how do you fight against popular culture? Because, like, do you or do you not? Like, how, do, how does that play when you're marginalized? <laughs> that wasn't <laughs> yeah. Next question. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I have some sense of that. It's like I'm not sure that I've ever actually even. That's a great question because it's not something I've ever really thought of because I'm so always like thinking about the margins and living at them and whatnot that I don't even usually get that privilege to think about that, you know, but mm. um, also, I mean, part of the, you know, it's even as I see poets who used to be at the margins come into the mainstream, and then I'll see them in, in popular culture. Um, one writer that for a long time was considered marginal is Frank O'Hara, mm. and then he was brought into the canon, and then suddenly he appeared at, in Mad Men. <laughs> like, he's Don Draper sitting there at a cafe reading his book, <laughs> and you're like, holy shit, you know, I mean, that's, and it's like, do I want to fight against that kind of uh, popular culture thing? I'm not sure, but one of the things that I do find like this beautiful terror about forms of democratic capitalism is that they do, they do have the ability to buy anything and sell it back to you. And that's part of the reason why resistances don't work and revolutions don't work in these systems because they'll just they'll just market it right back to you, sell it in a t-shirt. You know, when Occupy Wall Street, it was like Vice magazine. What I'm hearing is the margins defined as the edge of a flat map. Mm -hmm. And mm. my image of this is more like intensification. So that rather than being at the, at the edge, one begins at the normal and becomes more. And it is that act of becoming more that creates perhaps a little bit of a difference. So it's just a visual perception of growing rather than, than shifting sideways to a place of exile. <laughs> Thank you. And Daryl. Yes. Um, his name was Mr. Ng, and he was a great friend of the family. He drove the vegetable truck. Really? Oh, wow. Wow. nice. And um, Thank you. holy smokes. He was off the margins when he came. Yeah. And uh, he really went. But huh. for me, a margin was the piece of sheet paper in school. Mm. There was a margin yeah. on this side, a margin on this side, yeah. and there was a top and a bottom. Yeah. And I hated it so much, yeah. I turned them sideways. Oh, wow. So, there's no question. <laughs> so spell M-G? I-N-G. I-N-G, okay. That's not amazing. All my childhood, he was there. Yeah. Green truck. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Carol. And right there? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to say that when we're talking about the margins as being something flat and off the edge, I think of it more as a circle. The further you push the margins, the bigger the circle, and the circle contains all of us. And if you push the margins, you, the, the center tends to be the homogenous zone. Mm -hmm. We need to keep pushing the edges, mm -hmm. otherwise we don't have a bigger circle. Mm -hmm. That's a very Derridean perspective, sir. I appreciate that. Very what? Derridean perspective. <laughs> oh, there that's the only one. Would you explain the word you used? It's just um, the what adjectival form of Derrida's name. He was a the a, a theorist Derrida. Person I can't understand. Deconstruction. Yeah. <laughs> what it comes to mind for me 
is the positive aspect of art. When I think of Cahill's book, How the Irish Saved Civilization. Ireland was beyond the margin at that time. They actually brought civilization back to the center. And another more one that's been captured by the popular culture is Lord of the Rings. The hobbits were fucking nowhere. <laughs> and, and, and the hilarious picture of that wonderful quote where I, I think it's Gandalf or, well, it, no, Elrond says, when the eyes of the great are elsewhere, the hands of the small are busy. Now, I don't like this great and small, but we tend to do that in some way. But the sense is that while the hands of the great were somewhere else, it was the hobbit was taking the ring to destroy the great evil in that great story of Tolkien. Yeah. So I love, and something I'm noticing, and it's more of a US perspective, so I say this with real care as a Canadian, but I'm noticing that where I'm finding some of the most interesting poetry in the United States is from the black community. Yeah. It's from Kay Cannon. It's from uh, people like Carl Phillips mm -hmm. and Terrence Hayes. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a couple of other names that are uh, Lee Van Jordan, and, and there's a bunch of, of others. Um, oh, Tim Siebels. Um, I'm finding that's helping renew my own sense of poetry. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I come from a very Anglo-Saxon background, so it's so interesting for me to realize that, and I love what Renee said, is to bring the margin back into my sense. So, not to stay in that complacent place, but to go out where some of the new ideas are coming. So, this is more of a statement, but if there's any reaction on the panel, I'd love to have that sense of the creativity that comes out of it. Any comments, panel? Well, I, I guess I just don't know where else creativity comes from, but there. I, I don't, you know, having, maybe I'm not being able to see far, I, I don't see what the problem is. But that's because I guess I'm not marginalized. Uh, you know, I think that you, as a writer, that's where you, where else is there to live but on the edge? And, I mean, you don't say, I'm going to go and live on the edge. Other people say that about you. Yeah. But that's where you, <laughs> that's where you live. Some, some people do. It's called downward mobility. <laughs> no, there's a woman no, somebody else. Though. There's a, over there, too. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll go with you first. I just like to, <laughs> to make a point that I am considered mainstream, and there's a lot of problems with being mainstream, is that you are forced into category by just people looking at you yeah. that you're mainstream. And it, and even though you you uh, work or see things from from the margins, you're still and, and your whole life is formed by staying mainstream, and it's it's a very difficult thing to to um, fight against. Yeah, that's perception and of other people, against, and, and, and it's like saying someone's normal, and they aren't. No, so no. Uh, yeah, my my mentor, one of my mentors, Alice Fulton, uh, with she has this very similar experience and perspective where she's considered mainstream, but then the mainstream doesn't want her. Yeah. So she's yes. like, no, it doesn't yes. fit in. She's like, the, the people who are on the left and that the margins don't want me and they don't like mm. me. The people that are in, mm. considered mainstream don't like me. Like, where do I fit in? So mm. she sort of invented her own category of like, I guess I'm on the third coast. You know? And that was just kind of really interesting. Um, I was always really like, wow, you're kind of badass, lady. <laughs> Susan's off the continental breakfast. <laughs> or off the continent breakfast. Off the continental. Yeah, off the continent. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, there's invisible um, ailments that people have, so we put them in the mainstream, but meanwhile they're suffering from some painful disease that they're not aware of, yeah. which is true, right? We can't see it. Um, some <laughs> people are <laughs> like, they're aware of Okay, we'll do next. Yes, um, well, I'm from Chile. I live in Seattle, but I'm from Chile. Uh, I finished uh, finish filming a documentary in Chile about the, the fishermen from this small uh, fishing town, these fishing villages, uh, and how their lives have been changed because of the big fishing companies um, in southern Chile. All of the people there are um, native people from these communities. And uh, I, I find this conversation very interesting. Uh, I, I find it offensive, I'm sorry to all of you. This intellectual conversation about uh, marginalized people, how we intellectualize uh, being marginalized. Uh, it, it brings me back to when uh, white people uh, painted their faces black to be in the, in the film industry. 
Um, I saw uh, out there in, in southern Chile a group of poets, uh, all Chileans, because in southern Chile, uh, and native people are not Chileans, right, uh, for you to know. They are not Chilean citizens. The only way for them to be Chilean citizens is for them to go to the uh, civil registry, uh, registry and to sign their names as Chileans. So all the poets there in that gallery, in that big gallery, uh, one of them uh, in a, in a, a fake um, native um, ceremony pretending to be native. Um, I, back in the 80s, was allowed to be part of uh, the, co the community. I'm Chilean, I'm not native. Um, and I had the honor to be part of the community. And I know for a fact that you cannot even wear the outfit, the clothing of the native people. You cannot take a picture of a native people. In fact, it's illegal in Chile. If you see a picture of a native people in a book, you know that person surrounded, they surrounded their honor because Chilean, because native people in Chile uh, believe that their soul is broken when a picture is taken of themselves. So here we are having this conversation about margins and limits. Who are we? Who are we? What are we talking about? Mm -hmm. And I hear all these, these jokes and conversations about nothingness. I'm sorry I'm very emotional about this. Mm -hmm. Because I just finished filming a, 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 a documentary about fishermen who are losing their livelihood. Where these corporations from all over the world came to southern Chile. And it's not just in southern Chile, it's all over. Mm -hmm. And then I saw a gathering of about 150 poets from all over the world, just at the same time I'm filming the documentary. Gathering in southern Chile, at the same time, isn't the universe doing things at the same time? The universe does things. Um, for us poets, I gathered one thing today, and this, this amazing, I came here from Seattle, because I read, and I was invited here by a poet in, in Vancouver, um, because I heard the word um, poetry, ecology, and I thought, this is a great idea for me to go and meet people who have the same ideals. That's why I'm here. Um, because our planet is in danger. Our native people, and we are all native because we live in this planet. And this is an emergency. The fishermen in southern Chile, in Alaska, in the Dominican Republic, where I'm going next year to, to, to continue this documentary, um, in Seattle, where I spoke with the fishermen, um, everywhere in the world are in this danger. Their lives are being taken away. Are we poets? Are we prophets? Um, when I was there, I felt this energy walking next to me. And I'm going to tell you this experience. I felt this energy walking next to me in the middle of working with the filmmakers, with the photographers. I felt this energy. And I turned around, and this is all documented by the photographers. And there was this man, almost 90 years old. And I turned around, and I I started to cry, and I look at him, and it's just like I told somebody like a scene from the movies, and I told him, you are a poet. And I hug him, because I felt this from him, in this little tiny village in the middle of nowhere. And he looked at me, and we hug each other. The, the, the photographers were taking a lot of pictures of this. And he said to me, there were days where I went out to sea and I didn't fish anything because I wrote. The pictures are all over. They went, well, how the people, the people said it, it went viral. Pictures are all over. All these men, the photographers, nobody took credit of this. Just his name. People make posters all over the place. These men 
never went to college. He's never been in a gathering like we are. He's never traveled outside his town. He's nev he never met another poet before he met me and my friend who was with me, a very important poet there in Chile. He's never met another poet. He never went to a class to learn poetry. To learn the no, I, Thank you so much just, for, yeah, for I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I wanted to. No, that's all right. We're just going to move on sorry. because I'm there's sorry, a few more people that want to. Yes, I'm thank sorry you. To let you know this. Oh, yes. <laughs> We appreciate it. The Thank benefit you. of having an intellectual conversation about this is uh, please don't assume that there aren't people here doing actual work, yeah. practical work. Um, and please please don't please don't make that assumption because there are a lot of poets in this room that do actual physical cultural work um, in regards to what you're talking about. But also the benefit of having an intellectual conversation is that you are uh, talking to seats of power, and you can make things happen by doing that. Um, so I just want to throw that out there as um, something for us to consider, at least uh, while we're also considering these like severely important issues. Uh, yeah, uh, over here. I'll try to follow. Huh. I think you demonstrated the reason that we are all here. It is because we. It, we're here because of our heart, because of our passion, because of these beliefs that we have or don't have. My comment and question has been trying to swirl around from um, the perspectives that I've heard. Susan, I am the center of my universe also. So from the outside, you see me as whoever I am to you probably connected to the lady over there with the glasses, mm -hmm. more of the mainstream. I experience, as I posit that you also do, which is part of your creative gift to share what you feel, that I am marginalized in that there are so many groups at which I do not quite belong. I, I am on the outskirts of the queer community that I just don't feel such a an affinity or, or whatever, but I've struggled with those feelings. I also grew up in Victoria. I, you know, I, I didn't even meet a person that was Jewish until I was in my oh, yeah. mid-30s. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is I always, oh, they're Scottish, isn't that neat? I'm just Canadian. <laughs> Jewish people have got this culture. I just... Like, we, we make these margins for ourselves, and other people make them for me. I think that's what we're talking about, is that um, process of marginalized, who's, whose eyes are we looking for? Our own margins or someone else's? We feel them. <laughs> Speaking of the Scottish, there were uh, lots of Scottish settlers here in Nanaimo. And uh, for many years, there's been an event in May called Empire Days. Uh, Empire Days until this year. And the city council said, no more Empire Days. Actually, the previous um, Smyrnaimont chief, uh, Doug White, called it Stolen Land Days. <laughs> so, was there someone else up here? Um, I have to share an anecdote with you. I worked briefly in Zimbabwe and met a remarkable woman from Toronto named Rachel, who delivered a pair of conjoined twins, managed to raise money, talk the doctors in Toronto to operating on these children for free, got the mother a birth certificate which she didn't have, and got sent the mother, who was a illiterate farm woman from her own Zimbabwe to Toronto, where the children were separated and they're doing well. Rachel was a real ball of fire. She wrote later that she had visited a friend in Toronto at a high-rise apartment, went into the sauna, got to talking to a woman there, and she asked the woman what she did, and she said she was a spa critic. She wrote reviews of fancy resorts uh, to tell people who was the niftiest spa. Where, well, 
Rachel was going out in the van delivering HIV medications to people in rural Zimbabwe. When I read that, I decided I will never be a spa critic. <laughs> Even if I can't separate Siamese twins, I don't have to be a spa critic. And that's how I think of how we should live our lives. Let me just say something to the lady from Chile. I, I realize that it, it's, I hate the term first world problems, but when I've lived in Colombia, I've seen kids eating shoe leather on the street, so when people hear on the radio talk about food insecurity, it really annoys me because the term itself, people are hungry, they're starving. Um, our problems here doesn't mean that we're all bad people. We're actually all really good people here, and all the people in this room are trying to do their best to fix a broken world. And it probably does sound really indulgent for us to be talking about things like marginal. But we, we, we aren't the fishermen in this village, but there are people living here in Cascadia who are probably not quite as desperate as what you're describing, but they're desperate. Uh, in their First Nations villages you fly into that have no food at all uh, in Northern Ontario. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, de it's desperate. So I think that you can assume that here we, we all probably feel really guilty about what happens to the rest of the world, but this is what we're stuck with. We're, we're trying to stop the Enbridge pipeline so that you know, it doesn't pollute our water so we can still eat. Um, and it's, I know from living in, in South America that people are really passionate about things, and they've had a history that makes them that way because they, horrendous things we... You know, Victor Hara having his hands cut off and still singing to a stadium full of people. We don't have that here. So it's, it's really hard to live up to the kind of, you know, in, in, intense passion of other, and, and the intense misery of other places. But we're doing our best here, I think, individually. And as people, and as I say, this room is full of people who are on your side, even if it sounds like we're talking about things that might not relate, you might not relate to, but we are. Thank you. We have a few minutes left, Richard. I was just going to say, um, I want to go back to something that Susan said earlier about being on the margins is, is where we work, it's where we find our voices, it's where we find our craft. Everybody in this room is a poet, which is a marginalized yes. 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 Here's, here's the Here's the beauty of that, though. Because you're working in a genre that, you know, very few people view the radio or that that's about, it means we can do what we want because we're not controlled by centrist concerns with cash, you know, distribution, all of that. We find our ways out of that. You know, Barry was talking the other day, he was, had this wonderful session where he was handing around all these, uh, you know, uh, self-produced chapbooks and, and, you know, magazines. That's what we do, and that's how we reach each other, and that's how we push the margins. And that's, you know, back to Susan's point, that's why we're all here. And I'm thinking of um, where we don't have access because we're straight or queer or whatever we identify as. And there are people that literally don't have access because um, they're differently abled. And uh, so they literally can't get into that business or store or place to live. Anybody else? And? I just wanted to say to the woman from Chile that if she wants to give um, a YouTube link or something like that to any of us, um, I'm sure there are lots of people here who would be happy to uh, post your information on our social media. And I know I would, and there's probably others here too who would be happy to do that and share in your spreading the very important information that you want to get out to the world. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Yeah, okay, yeah. It seems to me that, as, as has been said, poets are at the margins. Poetry is supposed to be edgy, subversive. It, we know that from the beginning when Plato kicked the poets out yeah. of the Republic. <laughs> because they created rhythms that made the state a little bit nervous. There's one anecdote about a Canadian named Frankie James that maybe you haven't heard about. She's a graphic artist who does uh, satires of government and social things that are not working properly in this country. And she became very popular in Eastern Europe and was invited uh, to do a tour there. But at the last minute, the tour was dropped. Uh, she did a freedom of information search and she eventually got thousands of pages back. And on one of the sheets, it was 
a hot list from Foreign Affairs. So you scroll down to number 13, in between Iraq, Syria, and Pakistan, all the places that Canadian affairs, foreign affairs might be concerned about. And number 13, it said Frankie James, an inconvenient artist. <laughs> and that explained why she was, uh, her trip was cancelled. The government had interfered with that. So I think our, that's our tradition. We need to aspire to become inconvenient. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. the, the, email that said, the email from the government was, who was the idiot that okayed this grant? That was the email. <laughs> Okay, maybe one more <laughs> comment or question. Yvonne. I have a short comment. I just was, you know, thinking about what everyone's been saying, and I think in the way the way that we are not marginalized is that we all have a voice, and there are people who do not have a voice. And I think it's important for us to voice for those people. Yeah. Great. And uh, I think you know, I think it was Jeanette Armstrong many years ago talked about boundary work. So there are some people that are in between. And uh, so I want to thank our panel members, unless you have some closing comments. <laughs> I have right. one just okay. one really great question <laughs> about poetry being at the margins do. and speaking of first world problems, right? Because I think that this is actually like in more highly like well first world countries. Poetry gets pushed to the margins, but in other countries, that's not always the case at all. Which is kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, it's like I mean, uh, I've met poets from other countries, and they're like national heroes. They have billboards in their countries. You know, they're respected and paid. And like, there's something about where like, like very wealthy economies take us that these kinds of art forms like fall by the, you know, by the wayside or to the margins. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Susan Musgrave, Renee Sacklecar, and Nadine Maestas. Thank you. There's more coming up to you. Thank you. And let's go and have some lunch. Thank you.